If you've been with my channel for a while, you probably know that I do a lot of stuff with chemistry. I've distilled a super acid in my garage, tested both the stinkiest and spiciest substances respectively, and even filmed the obligatory chloroform video. But if you've been watching for even longer, you might remember that this channel wasn't always about chemistry. My first set of real YouTube videos were actually about this amazing piece of engineering. The Tesla Coil. In case you've never heard of it, this is a type of resonant transformer capable of producing discharges ranging from hundreds of thousands to millions of volts. In short, it's basically a lightning machine. Now, there are actually several different types of Tesla coils, each with their own pros and cons, and I've worked my way up the food chain to progressively make harder and harder models. My first coil used a simple spark gap driver, and with just five components, it was basically the easiest one to get working. After that, I tried my hand at several solid state coils, including a staccato QCW design that produced incredibly long arcs, and a high frequency Class E Tesla coil that could play audio through its sparks. Besides vacuum tube coils, I've basically covered every type of Tesla coil. Except one. The DRSSTC. The Dual Resonant Solid State Tesla Coil, or DRSSTC, is quite frankly nothing short of an engineering masterpiece. A well-built machine can easily produce lightning bolts several times longer than the coil itself, which is a feat not even Nikola Tesla himself could manage in his day. For years, it has been my dream to build one, but two things have kept me from doing so. The complexity and the price. While small models can be built for less than 100 bucks, medium and large coils can easily cost over $500, which is an amount that I couldn't justify throwing away at a passion project. And regarding the complexity, just look at these schematics. Oh, wait, sorry, that's an outdated prototype. Here is a real DRSSTC schematic. And this isn't even including the transistor inverter bridge, bus capacitors, or feedback transformers. Can you see why I've been hesitant? Of course, if you had told me just three years ago that I would successfully build any type of solid-state Tesla coil, I probably would have told you you're crazy. But here we are. And besides that, I might have been challenged to a Tesla coil duel by another YouTuber. So it looks like I have no choice but to overcome my many Tesla coil-related aversions and build an honest-to-god DRSSTC. And not just any DRSSTC, a massive, dual-winning DRSSTC that can easily outperform my opponent. Now, as a quick disclaimer, I'll be dividing this build up into two separate videos. This first video will be focused on the designs and a few of the key build steps, while the next video will be covering setup, operation, and if all goes well, the main Tesla coil duel. This may be a bit different from my usual all-in-one video style, but this is a very intensive build, and to be frank, I'm kind of running short on time. So without further ado, let's get into it. First off, let me explain some basics about the modern DRSSTC, just so we're on the same page. Like all Tesla coils, the main goal is to switch power through a small primary coil at a rate close to the resonant frequency of a much larger secondary coil. By doing this, when the coils are close together, the primary coil magnetically couples some of its energy into the secondary coil, where the voltage is magnified enough to break down the air and form an arc. Now, like all solid-state Tesla coils, DRSSTCs use transistor bridges to perform their primary power switching. In that sense, they aren't very unique. What sets them apart is how they do it. You see, in a standard SSTC, the primary coil acts like any other inductor and impedes the flow of alternating current, which tends to limit the coil's performance. The DRSSTC gets around this by having a capacitor placed in series with the primary coil, which effectively forms a series LC resonator. If the frequency applied by the transistor bridge matches the resonant frequency of this resonator, the inductive impedance drops to zero, and the only thing left to restrict current flow is the resistance of the wire itself. This, in turn, allows for much higher primary currents, and therefore a much greater output. To get the frequencies matching, DRSSTCs rely on direct primary feedback. Basically, the driver reads the natural resonant frequency of the LC resonator using a feedback coil, with one of the primary wires passing through it. A similar feedback coil is also used by the driver to detect and help prevent excessive current flow. Pretty impressive, right? Of course, we are barely scratching the surface of how this circuit works, and there's still a ton of very important stuff to go over. So rather than boring you with a detailed explanation of every component, I'll just give you all the important information quickfire style starting with a bit about the drive circuitry. Alright, the driver used in most coils is fairly universal at this point, and is usually referred to as the UD driver. Lone Ocean's model, the UD 2.7C, is probably the newest, most popular, and best documented version. Although Steve Ward's original UD 1.3B is still perfectly suitable for driving DRSSTCs. I posted links to both in the video description. For my coil, I'll be using my own variation of the UD driver, which I've dubbed the UD Lite. Essentially, it's an all-through-hole version of the UD 1.3B, with an added phase shifter and a few other updates borrowed from the UD 2.7C.
drivers control the transistor bridge through gate drive transformers, or GDTs, which are typically hand wound using ferrite toroids. For large coils, these 61mm cores made from number 77 material seem to be the most favored option, although they are somewhat expensive. Similar ferrites are also used in the feedback coils for the driver and overcurrent detection, although a single large core may be combined with two smaller cores to accomplish this more effectively. With 24 volts coming from the UD driver, you want a GDT turns ratio of 1 to 1. In other words, for every 10 to 14 turns on the GDT primary, you'll want the same number of turns on the secondary. In contrast, the two feedback coils require a roughly 1000 to 1 turns ratio. While this may sound impossible, it's really as simple as adding 32 turns to the main ferrite core and then looping one turn around a smaller ferrite with 32 turns on it. The outputs from the gate drive transformers are also connected to these miniature circuits. The resistor helps prevent gate ringing, and the diode enables quick transistor switch-offs. Optionally, a 33 volt TVS diode can also be added across the gate to help stop harmful voltage transients. To protect the transistors further, large snubber capacitors are typically placed across each half-bridge section. 1 to 2 microfarads is typically acceptable, although more capacitance is desired when you're running at higher peak currents. Use this equation provided by Kaiser Power Electronics to help determine a good capacity. The voltage of each capacitor should be at least a few hundred volts higher than the expected bus capacitor voltage. For the inverter, it's best to have all the components close together and positioned in a way that minimizes loops and induction. In a large DRS STC, the connections are typically made with thick pieces of metal referred to as bus bars, which are usually custom made. For the sake of ease, I recommend using strips of aluminum or flattened copper pipes, which can both be bought in most hardware stores. The transistor of choice in most Tesla coils is the IGBT, and in large DRS STCs, modules from the CM and SKM series are both fairly popular. These need to be bolted to a large aluminum heatsink to prevent overheating. The power source, or bus supply, is typically composed of large capacitors in a voltage doubler configuration. The capacitors should be rated for at least a few thousand microfarads, and the diodes need to be capable of handling the expected current flow, which is typically limited to 15 amps in most homes, unless you're using a heavy-duty appliance outlet. In some cases, a soft start circuit may be required to help prevent high inrush currents from killing the diodes. For most standard DRS STCs, a battery-powered interrupter connects to the driver via an ST fiber optic cable. The interruption frequency is usually kept below 1 kHz, and the pulse width is typically no longer than a few hundred microseconds. Once you start pulsing close to or above 1 millisecond, you risk damaging the transistors. Of course, there are ways around this, such as detuning and freewheeling, but they require specialized drivers and are mostly beyond the scope of this project. There really isn't a hard set of rules for how you should set up your coil, but there are a few things to consider. For one, you'll want a fairly moderate coupling coefficient to help prevent arcovers, racing sparks, and similar issues. You can calculate this value very easily in Java TC, and it should be less than 0.2. With the secondary coil, it's usually best to have a shorter, fatter coil with a large top load. The height of the winding itself should be 3 to 5 times the coil's diameter, but feel free to experiment beyond these boundaries. Just be aware that if a coil is too short, it may experience more primary strikes, and if it's too tall, its output could be negatively impacted. Also, make sure that your coil resonates at a frequency that the IGBTs can handle. For example, certain modules like the CM300 can't reliably switch more than 80 or 90 kHz, so they can really only be used in medium or large coils with low resonant frequencies. For the primary circuit, it's best to have more capacitance and fewer primary coil turns. The capacitors should be polypropylene film capacitors with low internal resistance and high ratings for voltage, DVDT, and peak current. If you want to know some good capacitors or run calculations to see how they'll perform in your coil, visit the Kaiser Power Electronics website. I've put links to their MMC calculator and recommended capacitor page down below. Okay, I think that's just about everything. The rest of building a DRS STC is fairly straightforward. Once the design is finalized and the parts are collected, just wire it together and tune it. Now, there are really only three bits that need tuning and adjustment, and that's the phase shifter, overcurrent detector, and primary coil. For the overcurrent detector, you simply use this equation to determine the correct voltage to set for a desired peak current, and you adjust the trimmer potentiometer on the UD driver until the voltage at the OCD checkpoint lines up. For the phase shifter, you'll need to probe the voltage between the IGBT collector and emitter with an oscilloscope, and adjust the slot 7 inductor on the PCB until the spikes and ringing disappear. This indicates optimal switching and minimal stress on the transistors. 
And finally, for the primary coil, you'll just need to play around with the number of turns until you get the circuit tuned to a frequency that generates the largest discharge from the secondary coil without tripping the overcurrent detector. For best results, tune the primary circuit 5-10% to lower than the secondary resonant frequency. This will help accommodate for the detuning caused by spark formation, and it can also reduce transistor stress. So now, with all this in mind, what do I have planned for my DRSSTC? Well, let me show you. For the secondary coil, I bought this 6 inch diameter clear acrylic tube and 8 ounces of 34 gauge magnet wire. My goal is to have a 16 inch tall coil with a resonant frequency near 75 kHz, but to get a frequency that low, I'll need a top load. So I modeled up this 16 inch toroid with a 4 inch minor diameter and 3D printed it in 4 separate sections, which I epoxied together and wrapped in aluminum tape. All in all, I don't think it came out half bad. For the primary coil, I'll finally be trying a traditional pancake spiral made from quarter inch copper tubing which I bought from Home Depot. And, as with the secondary coil, all of the mounting will be taken care of with 3D printed parts. The same applies for the capacitor bank, which will be a 0.25 microfarad 6 kV bank made from the classic 942C Cornell Dublier capacitors used in so many other coils. The inverter bridge is a CM300 IGBT full bridge, complete with two microfarad snubbers on each half bridge module, and this massive 8 pound aluminum heatsink. To power it, I'll be using two 3,300 microfarad capacitors arranged in a voltage doubling configuration with a pair of 30 amp diodes. This should give a total of 1,650 microfarads, and with 240 volts AC going in, I should have 680 volts DC going to the bridge. A big shout out goes to All Science, who actually sent me all the high power electronics being used in this build. Be sure to check out his channel, which I've linked in the video description. The CM300 bridge will be driven by my custom UD Light driver which will itself be powered by this 24 volt 5 amp LED power supply. In case that fails though, I also have the UD2.7C driver made by Lone Oceans on standby. And finally, there's the coil base. Normally, I would be building this from scrap wood that I'd cut with my admittedly shoddy power tool skills. But for this build, I wanted to go all out and make something decent. So I teamed up with a sponsor of this video, Creality, who sent me their Falcon 2 laser engraver to try out. The Creality Falcon 2 is a high quality laser cutter and engraver, that boasts operating speeds as high as 25,000 mm per second. The unit itself comes mostly pre-assembled, and the rest can be set up in just three simple steps, attaching the risers, mounting the laser module, and connecting the air assist. Once assembled, the Falcon 2 is incredibly stable, which is part of the reason why it can print so well at such high speeds. Another reason is the groundbreaking integrated air assist, combined with Creality's patented air duct design. Believe me, having the right amount of airflow can make all the difference in a laser job, and fortunately, Creality made it really easy to adjust with just one gear. To use the Falcon 2, it's important to have the right software installed. Lightburn is an excellent choice, but if you're looking for a free option, I recommend Laser GRBL, which is what I use. With these programs, you can run the Falcon 2 completely offline, using either the included USB-C cable or the microSD card. All you have to do is create your own design in a program like Inkscape, upload it to your software interface, select the correct parameters for a given material, and laser away. With its powerful 22 watt laser head, this machine can easily cut up to 15 millimeters of wood in a single pass, which is much better than their previous 10 watt Falcon laser engraver released in 2021. It also has no trouble cutting 10 millimeter acrylic and even 0.05 millimeter steel, which I found really impressive. And to top things off, the beam is actually strong enough to engrave metal surfaces, leaving something of a beautiful result in its wake. Now, with such a powerful laser setup, one of my main concerns was obviously the safety of this device. However, I'm happy to say that after using the Falcon 2, I actually found myself quite pleased with the security of this machine. It features a so-called triple monitoring system that keeps track of nozzle airflow, flame presence, and even lens cleanliness. Normally, the system will only alert you with the lights on the laser head, but you can also enable the alarm system using a few simple software commands. For example, here's how you enable the air assist alarm in Laser GRBL. Similar commands can also be used to alert you of flame presence and lens cleanliness issues. And speaking of lens cleanliness, Creality made it super easy to clean their laser lenses. All you have to do is unscrew the air nozzle, undo the support ring, and pop out the lens. The Falcon 2 kit includes a microfiber cloth and tweezers to aid in the cleaning process, as well as a new lens in case there is a more serious issue with the original. All in all, I think the Creality Falcon 2 is an amazing piece of equipment, and I'm super happy to have it in my arsenal. If you're interested in purchasing one of your own, be sure to check it out on Creality's website, using the links below. Just be aware that the honeycomb, roller unit, and product cover are not included with the standard kit, and they must be purchased separately. Alright, with the base done, there should only be a few other things for me to take care of before completing my coil assembly. I'll try to cover the rest in the part 2 video, but for now, I need to focus on some other projects. 
Oh, we crap! <laughs> if you find my content interesting, make sure you're subscribed to my channel. And if you want to help support projects like this, consider donating or becoming my patron on Patreon. The links, as always, are down below. A special thanks goes out to all the dedicated lab coat supporters. This DRSSTC build has been my most expensive project to date, and I'm truly grateful for their support. Stay safe, everyone, and I'll catch you next time. Lab coats out.